You can't build the work until you land the work. Yes, you know that's true. <laughs> Which means your estimating has to be on point. And that's why I'm excited to have as a guest today on Construction Genius, Paul McEwen. He is the CEO of B2W Software. And B2W Software is a software package for heavy civil construction companies. And during our conversation today, we discuss the importance of being detail-oriented, the importance of communication of information from the field to the estimating department, and what goes into making an estimator who is successful and able to land the right projects with the right clients so that you build a strong backlog. Feel free to share this interview as you listen to it with other people who you think may benefit from it. There are links in the show notes to how you can get in touch with Paul. I do appreciate his time and I thank you for listening to Construction Genius today. This is Eric Anderton and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. Paul, welcome to Construction Genius. Thanks, sir. Nice to be with you today. I'm very excited to have you on the show because you work with heavy highway and civil construction companies, and I have a number of very um, excellent clients in those areas. You can see the hard hat of Tykert in the back here. It's one of the mm -hmm. killer companies here in California. So I have a question for you. In your experience, what sets apart the most successful heavy highway and civil contractors from the herd in terms of their ability to land work, their estimating? Well, you know, I think that it's been the case that over the last 15 years, there's been an evolution off of spreadsheets onto more formalized systems like B2W estimate, for example. And I think, you know, in a margin pressured space, um, it's very competitive. And there's, a, I think, an awakening or an understanding that the estimate really forms the basis for a almost a mini P&L for the job. It is the forecast for profitability for the job. And so I think the companies that do uh, put the most effort and detail into their estimating are generally the ones that are the mo most successful. So the ones that really take the time to understand what, what is it going to cost me to do this work in terms of materials? How can I really go in and, and use a tool that will help me understand uh, how the bid changes based on different pieces of equipment, based on different production rates? So really taking the time to do very, very detailed estimates and get down to the lowest cost in order to do the project that's before them uh, is a critical, a critical thing. And when you're up against someone that's using a spreadsheet, you know, often folks are, are really just more throwing some type of a, a, a guesstimate or a kind of a, an anticipated unit cost for individual components of work in the bid. Uh, and that becomes quite erratic and generally not very successful. What you're looking for then is, is consistency. And, and like you said, the detail of information, what sets apart the most successful companies in terms of how they gather the information necessary to put out a detailed estimate? Sure. Well, typically in these heavy highway or infrastructure type bids, whether it's a private project or a state or federal project, you know, it, it's, it's a process of determining what type of equipment you'll use, which is really analytical. You're really kind of tweaking the bid to look at different production rates. It's the process of trying to negotiate the best rates for materials that may be in, involved in the project. It's involves, it involves going out and looking to get quotes for a, a broad range of subcontracted work within the bid. Uh, and when you're using a formalized tool, that can be done far more efficiently you know, you can send out hundreds of requests for quotes to subcontractors and material suppliers with literally a mouse click, and then get back information that lets you really better understand exploring who would be the best provider of different services and materials 
within the bid. So at the end of the day, I think what separates the most successful would be the folks that take the time necessary to do a very, very detailed job looking at a project. These bids are often two, three, four, five hundred line items of work on the DOT side, for example. Yeah. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of detail that goes into those, those estimates. Uh, and so the folks that take the time to really explore how they can do the work in the least costly way, those are the companies that are the most successful for sure. Interesting, because as you're describing this, I, I think of what, what makes up an ideal estimator from a, a behavioral point of view in your experience in a um, heavy civil company? You know, I really think that the best estimators are the ones that are the most detail-oriented. They're patient. Yeah. They're yeah. highly analytical. Um, you know, they're not in a rush. So they're really taking the time and they have a disposition and a personality that's conducive to being very detail-oriented, uh, very analytical, thoughtful. You know, the, these bids can get into a real, you know, flurry at the tail end with subcontractors often changing their prices last minute and material prices perhaps changing last minute. And so I think trying to be level-headed, patient, analytical, those are really, I think, the skill sets, the personality traits that make the best estimate estimators. It sounds like also there, there has to be a willingness to, or an ability at least to an extent to relate to people and to, to reach out to them and to form those relationships where perhaps um, you're able to negotiate in a successful way, not just analyze a, a, um, a set of documents and, and draw conclusions from that. Is, is that right? Yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, certainly they're, you know, highly successful estimators, chief estimators, they have, you know, a, a strong rapport with the folks that they're relying on uh, for equipment, for materials, for the various subcontracted trades. So I do think that those relationships certainly do play a critical role in in terms of being able to get uh, not just good proposals back, but I will say timely proposals back. Often, I think what happens is the subcontractors, material suppliers, equipment uh, companies, and so forth, you know, they're looking, looking to do business with people that they have a good rapport with, that they've worked with for a long time. So that certainly is a, a major benefit as well. As you work with um, companies and, and estimators, and you know, you know how it is. Someone puts a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into putting together a big bid, and they lose out to their competitor by, you know, thousands. If if you know a very very small margin. Sure. In your experience, what is the main reason somebody is consistently missing out? What 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 are, what are the uh, understanding that detail orientation is extremely important? What do you find gets missed the most? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, I think the thing that leads folks to not be successful in bidding is is not getting into the level of detail, trying to do it, um, you know, perhaps too quickly, trying to do it the wrong way with, you know, a spreadsheet, for example, where you're really not able to get into the level of detail. And, you know, the problem that that causes is you don't really ever fully understand mm -hmm. how you could change things within the bid. You don't have enough information to be able to really tweak and refine the bid. So that's that's a big, big problem. And I think that that leads, you know, often to a, a lack of success. Interestingly, conversely, there certainly are times where somebody that uses a spreadsheet and doesn't use a formalized system, you know, may be successful on a bid, but to their own detriment. I've seen some bids where, you know, the, the difference between the low bid uh, and the next bid is pretty dramatic. Yep. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. You, you can lose a lot of work. And in some cases, it's a double-edged sword because you can get a job that you didn't fully understand and put yourself in a bad spot. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, so as I'm approaching an estimate, in your experience, where, where do the most successful companies start? How do they start getting their arms around uh, um, an estimate and a project so that they can begin that process of um, executing an estimate in a detailed way? Yeah, great, great question. I think what's interesting about the most successful companies that I've worked with is that it's not just around a specific job and they're analyzing what they're going to do on any given bid. There's more, there's more that goes into it than just the bid itself. So for mm. example, they'll want to look at market conditions. They'll want to look at their backlog. They yep. want to look at their resource utilization. Yep. Um, they're going to want to look at, you know, is, is there a job that they can bid where you know, it's going to fit well into 
the, the types of work that they're trying to do over the course of the next year, two, three, and so forth and so on. So there's a more holistic view early on in terms of the market and their backlog and the type of work that they may feel they need to go out and get. Uh, that that kind of discussion, if you will, takes place before the estimate. And that definitely shapes the estimate. So for example, if someone has a really good backlog and they bid on a project, they may bid it in a way that they, they kind of have a, if we get it, great. If we don't get it, that's fine too. And often, you know, they'll, they'll win a job perhaps because somebody else or another bidder or several other bidders has already got a pretty big backlog or, or what have you. So you basically, you, you want to win the work that's going to be the most beneficial for you as it fits into your backlog. So you have to take a strategic approach right at the beginning whenever you're looking at a project. That's exactly right. Now, obviously, every company is different, and therefore, they execute work in, in a different manner. And the best companies are, are very effective at getting the information from the field that they need to shape a realistic estimate. Talk a little bit about how estimators and the best companies facilitate that communication between the field and the estimating side of the business so that they do produce those accurate detail oriented estimates? Yeah, that's a great question for us. You know, we have a, a platform of different solutions for the construction space and our, our second most popular tool is a tool that's used B2W track in the field. Uh, and that has really exploded over the last five or six years. And, and the critical part there is that when you bid a project, as I mentioned, it really forms the basis of a, a mini P&L or a forecast for profitability. Yep. And so what's critical as, you are, as the work is being done is that the folks that are doing those estimates are getting some feedback around how their assumptions panned out. So when we said that we we're gonna do excavation at a certain rate per cubic yard per day and so forth and so on, how is that work proceeding? Is it on track? Is it not on track? In our case, those details come back directly from the field into the estimating tool, into the project. So somebody can actually go in and see, this is how we bid it, and this is what's actually happening real time. And that gives you the ability then to have some real world experience as you continue to bid similar types of jobs. You can say, well, in one spot, I thought our production would be lower, it turned out to be higher. This next job I'm gonna bid on seems similar. So that may be an advantage for me in terms of creating a more competitive bid. So that kind of feedback, understanding the difference between how it was bid and how it was built is really vital in continuing to really refine your estimating across specific types of work. Excellent. Excellent. Um, and let me just take a step back then. So let's say you're a company that you know, typical construction companies have folks who've been in the business for you know a long time, and maybe they are comfortable in that spreadsheet environment. And and you know they're old school, <laughs> so they're they're kind of wedded to their process. How do the best companies facilitate that technology shift from, you know, an Excel-based system to something a little more sophisticated? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. You know, it was the case I would say ten to twelve years ago, maybe fifteen years ago, where a lot of times the the push to do something more formal often came from from the estimating team. And that's still true today, but I think part of the shift is that now, I think a big driver is management. So I think now management is more pushing for tools to automate the business uh, operationally so that they can really drive you know, profitability, efficiency, and profitability for the business. Okay. And so what happens when you get resistance to that? Well, I think the key thing in, in, in the most successful companies that I've seen embrace technology, there is a mandate from management that if they're going to invest the kind of money that is often invested, that the teams are going to use the tool. The companies that fail uh, are typically ones where, you know, management might've come along and said, this is what we want to do. And then they got tremendous pushback and it really uh, never took hold. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a recognition today that certainly in the estimating piece, for sure, you know, you, you have to use far more effective, detail-oriented, powerful tools to be able to do these estimates. And there's another component to it as well, which is not only can you do more detailed estimates, but in some respects, you can certainly do them, believe it or not, quicker than you could do it with a spreadsheet. Yes. 
And secondly, you can bid far more work. So it's not just more effective bids. It's the ability to bid far more work than you could possibly do with spreadsheets. Okay. Yep. Now, I, I know that your company is, is very much focused, obviously, on software and, and, and helping folks with that. As, a, as a, a software provider, why is it that soft um, technology changes in a construction company fail? Well, I, again, I think what happens is um, there are a lot of times where management you know, mandates the tools and then they don't continue to kind of force that mandate. That's certainly one contributing factor. Another contributing factor could be that perhaps a company made the wrong decision. We certainly have seen that where they've, they've purchased a, a set of tools that they thought would work one way and they really didn't. And they invest a lot of time, energy, and effort to try to stand those tools up and they're just not going to work for their business. Or it could be that you buy a, a, a set of solutions from a company where those solutions in a general sense could work. But for some reason, one critical aspect of driving success with the implementation of software or the adoption of software is the implementation. So you really have to be involved with a company that is going to really guide you through and take the time to do a very, very detailed implementation of the software. And it's not just the implementation, for example, of the estimating tool. It's really looking more holistically around if you were going to use four or five different solutions that support your operations with estimating, tracking, scheduling, equipment maintenance, those things all touch each other. Right. And so you really need to holistically understand how do you want them to all work together? What type of reporting, what type of integration with accounting all those types of things have to be looked at, explored, and planned for as part of the implementation. So that's a big driver of success or failure, for sure. Well, this is one of the challenges, just as you're speaking, I'm thinking one of these challenges is that so, uh, construction companies are presented with software solutions on a consistent basis in a variety of different areas, and your company provides a variety of different software solutions. And as an owner of a company, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not buying software because I love software. I'm buying software because of what it what it does for me, what it, what it produces or what it facilitates. And so in your experience, is, is, is it better for a company to start small or just to kind of bite the bullet and go after eating the elephant all at once? How, how, what, what is your experience there? Yeah, great question. I, you know, I think to some degree that really depends on the company, you know, beyond the services and the team that's provided by a company like mine to work on implementation and training and so forth. You, you want to make sure you have a company that's prepared for whatever it is they're going to embrace. So there are certainly times when a company is fully ready to embrace the whole thing at once. And there are certainly times when a company, maybe technology is somewhat new to them and they kind of want to take a crawl, walk, run approach. So they might roll out one or two pieces of the puzzle uh, and then you know plan for the rest down the road. But what is critical is even if they're only going to plan for the rest down the road, we still would want to understand, for example, what is the rest of the, the implementation going to look like? What are the requirements? Because that can influence what we do up front, even on one or two pieces that they may invest in up front. Yeah, I understand that. So it's, it's really interesting because it's such a, number one, it's a, an investment of money, obviously, and, and considerable amount of money, depending on you know the, the scale of the the implementation, but then also a tremendous amount of investment of time and, and, um, and, and it is disruptive. Um, what do you do as you're going through an implementation to help the, uh, the construction companies overcome those obstacles and those roadblocks? Uh, what do you guys do from the sort of the handholding point of view that sets you apart perhaps from other companies? What insights have you learned? Well, you know, for us, it actually starts in the sales process. We use a kind of a solution-based selling process, and we don't just kind of jump online and show someone our software. Right. We do a lot of work up front to really understand what are the challenges, what type of business are they in, what problems are they trying to solve. So there's a lot of information that's gleaned even in the sales process up front that's then taken forward with the implementation team. So what's critical is before you start to implement anything, you try to understand everything. Where implementations fail is when you jump in with both feet, you charge down a path and you find 10 or 12 different things that you didn't fully understand or know that you know can really cripple or ruin the implementation. Right. So I think it's listening to the customer. It's forcing them to take the time to give you the information that's needed to do an effective rollout. 
Um, you know, we have kind of a milestone based implementation where we're not going to let someone get to the next milestone and, until they finish the current milestone. Yep. So I do think it's just guiding them in a detailed way and forcing them to think critically around what it is they're trying to accomplish. That's really, really vital. And that at that point, when you get to the training, then, you know, you're training people and they're looking at the software and they're looking at information that they're familiar with. Ease of use is a big part, you know, in terms of how they use the software, but they're looking at information that's familiar. They're looking at reporting, for example, that's familiar. Uh, the integration with the counting software has been all mapped out and implemented. So again, it's, it's, being, it's taking the time to really be thoughtful and thorough before you jump in uh, with both feet and drowned. What are red flags for you? Let, let's say you're, you're, you're working with a construction company. From a niche perspective, they're a good fit. In other words, your software can help them. But there are red flags from a, a management or leadership perspective that tell you that we could take these guys' money and we could go down the road with them, but it's not going to work. Tell me what some of those red flags are. Sure. That's, a, that's a, an interesting question. So as I said before, I think one key component is that management fully embraces, is going to drive, and is going to mandate that these tools be used and used correctly. And the red flags that we would get, you know, kind of in the implementation process early on would be someone's trying to rush the process, kind of, you know, we'll, we'll get to that particular piece, if you will, later. And sometimes you, it's difficult. You have people that don't want to make some level of change, or they see that the things have to be done exactly as they think they should be done, when in the course of rolling out something like our tools, that would not be the right way to do it. So I think that's, those are the red flags where people start to you know, not perform in terms of providing the right kind of information, the right detailed information. And they get, they don't get pushback from management to say, listen, you know, B2W knows what they're doing and we need to follow their process if we're going to achieve success. Interesting because I'm, I'm just picturing, you know, you going into a construction company where you got a, a bunch of A-type personalities as, as the uh, software provider, you guys have got to step up quite a bit and let people know when they're going down the wrong path and say, hold on a minute, guys, this is not going to work if you, if you go this way. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, that, that was, a, I think, a, um, a learning phase for us and the growth of the company, too, is, is to really understand that you, you have to get buy-in from management. Uh, you know, there have been times even in the course of the sales process early on where a, company's, a company may generally be in a space that certainly is a good fit for our software but they have such an unusual workflow and such unrealistic expectations that we actually just won't take the business. That's, that's important. You know, the, the bottom line is if a company fails with our software, that's, that's 10 times more impactful than if they're successful. We need to make sure that we're driving companies to success with the tools. I would imagine from a sales perspective, it's, it, you, you have to, there's times where you, you have to be able to walk away from a deal, so to speak, in order to best serve yourselves as a, as a software company, but then also um, maintain your reputation in the industry. Yeah, there's no question. And there certainly have been some processes that we've been involved with, with you know, large, large, large companies where they just have such unique expectations and requirements that are really not, um, I would say, you know, standard, if you will. And there's a, there's a desire to kind of want to move the software in a direction that, that it isn't really designed for. And, and sometimes pretty deep into the process, we'll ultimately say, you know, this is not going to be a good fit. And so we're going to respectfully bow out. So then with, with that in mind, what advice would you give to a, um, a construction company CEO in terms of how to identify a software company that is a good fit to work with them? Well, you know, in the heavy civil construction space, there's, there's a... I would say there's maybe maybe three or so potential vendors that you could choose from. And yeah. all of those vendors certainly have products that are feature rich. They have somewhat of a similar group of capabilities. I really think another aspect beyond the fit of the software is the fit culturally of the team. So I think that you really, you know, you should talk to multiple vendors and, and get a sense of even beyond what their software will do and not do and how someone else's software might do things differently and better, is the company a good fit? 
Do you feel good about the company? Do you feel like it's going to be a good partner? Because at the end of the day, I tell folks, you know, you're not investing in software, you're investing in a partnership. And if the partnership doesn't feel good upfront, that's probably not a good sign. Yeah, that's really great. So then taking an, an, another s a step to the side here, um, regardless of the software that I, I might might or might not choose, if I'm looking at my, my company at the moment and either I'm landing work that I've bid poorly on and I'm losing money on it, or I'm missing out on some bids that I really would like because um, of a couple of points here or there, how can I immediately begin to take action to improve my estimating? Well, I think it would depend on what you're doing for your estimate. You know, if you're if you're using spreadsheets, now there's, there's a lot of factors that go into the success of an estimating department. There's certainly the people. Yep. You know, there are cases where people have done it a certain way forever, and they just don't want to let go of how they've done it. That's generally yeah. not a good sign. Yes. So you know, I, th I think at the end of the day, if you don't have the right tools you're you're not going to be successful you know you're not going to go out and you know dig a hole with an asphalt paver so if yep. you're trying to use a, a powerful tool for the wrong problem you're not going to you're not going to resolve it so you know i think folks ultimately have to come to the fact that you have to really do things in detail and be thoughtful uh, in order to really be to be able to bid effectively and and as i said before that's going to help you understand which job you shouldn't take Yes. And help you do better on the jobs that you really want and need. And the more successful you get, success breeds success. You know, the companies that are the most profitable are the ones that have a big backlog. Yep. You know, they're successful. As they're, they're estimating is very successful. They build a big backlog and they're able to be picky about going at the jobs that they really, really, really want and strategic around, you know, continuing to keep that backlog pretty full. So they're maximizing the profitability which involves a whole host of things like cash flow uh, analysis and the work that's on the books by phase code. It involves uh, resource utilization, you know, if we're bidding on big work, but I know that in six months with all the work that's on the books, we don't have, you know, enough dozers or we need a different crane. All those pieces of information shape how you'll bid a project and, and frankly, whether you'll bid a, bid a project. No, I really appreciate that. Tell us a little bit more about your company then. What, what is it that you guys do for, for construction companies, Paul? I mean, at the end of the day, what we do is we provide a platform of tools. It's called the One Platform. And those tools handle a kind of a, a range of workflows outside of accounting, which kind of start with the estimating piece of it, uh, picks it up in the field tracking uh, component B2W track, which allows folks to be in the field and collect information about production, labor usage, equipment usage, material usage. Um, you know, those tools are giving, for example, the, the foreman instant feedback around how they're doing on the job each day based on the estimate. Yep. So they can see that the minute they complete a field log, automating the payroll, everything goes automatically to payroll. Um, so it's giving you a tremendous amount of information to understand how is the project going day to day and what do you need to do to bring it on track if it's off track or what can you do to drive an even higher profit profitability than you had perhaps originally intended. Um, we take it from there with our scheduling and dispatching tool huh? where that tool is essentially helping you manage all the equipment moves, uh, the material purchases. Uh, a very, very powerful tool that's with the click of a button, notifying all the employees around what job they're going to be on tomorrow, where and what time, notifying the foreman or project supervisor uh, automatically that a specific piece of equipment is going to be coming off the job tomorrow morning at 730, uh, or you'll be receiving another piece of equipment. Um, so tremendous detail. And the uniqueness of all these workflows is it's they're all shared in a common uh, browser-based platform. It's really one platform that supports all these workflows. So you don't have disparate Windows systems that don't really integrate. Then we pick it up with equipment maintenance. Uh -huh. So a very powerful tool that's helping you essentially drive equipment uptime with proactive uh, equipment maintenance and repair. And you know, again, in terms of the 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 sharing of information real time across this platform, if someone in the shop, for example says that next Tuesday, they're going to take dozer number 36 down for repair for the day. Um, then, then the folks that are scheduling work know that piece of equipment isn't going to be available. So the way in which all these workflows are sharing information real time 
is a real driver around, you know, awareness of what's going on. And the final piece for us is we have a tool for allowing folks to essentially go paperless. So it's a, another part of the platform that lets folks go in, for example, and customize with our help safety forms where they can create their own safety forms or use safety forms that are more standard that come from us. And it collects all that data and it all becomes reportable in terms of KPIs and, and reporting. So for example, if a foreman were using that component in the field and they said that on a form there was an injury, so they select injury and hospitalization, simply by selecting those two things, it sends an email and or text to a range of people that you've previously defined. So again, creating a tremendous amount of awareness across the enterprise that drives at the end of the day, more efficiency and higher profitability. When people engage with you, where do they typically begin? Because that's, you know, obviously you just described, you described the elephant. Um, <laughs> where do people yeah. typically begin there? <laughs> So, you know, typically um, folks begin with, I would say that 90% of the companies that get on board with B2W buy our estimating tool. There's another huge percentage that will buy the estimating tool and the tracking tool because there's such, you know, synergy between those two directly. And then it, it, it goes down a little bit as you get to folks that will also at the same time upfront invest in scheduling, maintenance and inform, but, but that's growing. The number of people that are basically diving in and getting all of it is, is going up dramatically. And I think there's a whole number of reasons why that's true. For, for our company, we've really deepened and broadened our offering significantly in the last five years. And so uh, they're very, very, very powerful, feature-rich tools, a huge focus on ease of use, which is critical in the construction space. We have a very, very powerful mobile stack where you can take our a tablet and go out in the field and do all these different workflows. Um, we have by customer demand, we have another component that we just released, which allows folks to even capture time in production on a smartphone for people that aren't really working perhaps directly on a crew. So it could be folks that are out working at the plant, the quarry, or it could be someone that's on a project running a grader for the day, but they're not out there really in the context of a crew. They're just out on a job on their own, but it gives them the ability to put in their production and their time, which gets instantly sent to the office and is approved. And that becomes the basis of their payroll. And those costs roll into the project as well. Very, very powerful, very flexible. We just unveiled that at our user conference in California back in uh, February. You said that, that people are embracing more than just the, the estimate or the schedule part of your offering for, more, for a variety of reasons. Can you just give me a couple of those reasons? Because again, I'm, I'm thinking as a construction company owner, there, there's a tremendous amount of work involved in, in the more that you take on, obviously, the more work that's involved. So, so what are some of those reasons that people are deciding to do that? So I think at the end of the day, typically when we get engaged in uh, a sales process with the company, you know, we're, first of all, we're understanding what the business challenges are. What do, you, what do you use for tools today across those workflows that I just defined? So we really can understand where there's opportunity for them. But at the end of the day, what happens is in a presentation, which will typically, if not almost always include all of our tools, they see the synergy around all of these workflows. So as I mentioned, you know, if, you're, if you have estimate, it instantly feeds to the field field instantly feeds back to the estimate. If you're in the field and you have a piece of equipment that goes down, you can create using the field tool, a repair request for the maintenance division, which with a single mouse click goes to the maintenance product, the third, one, one of the third uh, or a third workflow. As that particular request is being scheduled by the team out in the garage, the, the, the maintenance team, that schedule is instantly updated back inside of field so they can see I reported this problem on Tuesday. Wednesday, right. they can open up the software. And so good news, it's going to be fixed by Friday morning. And then, you know, with, with scheduling, if you're using our scheduling tool and someone's scheduling the equipment moves and the crews and the production targets for the work that's going to be done across all the jobs tomorrow, 
somebody in the field that goes to do their field log for the day. I'm on this job. What phase codes am I supposed to work on? What is my target production? What does my crew look like? They click one button and it just gets all that information from the scheduling component. So it really motivates folks to want to kind of embrace all of it is it's kind of one plus one equals five. Sure. There's so much synergy and so much information and situational awareness you get from using all of them that it becomes very, very powerful. So as, as I'm thinking about long-term improving my estimating department, I've, I've listened to some of the advice that you've given here, Paul, and it's been right on point. What are two or three action items I should take right away to begin to up my game and improve my hit rate with the right projects in the right locations? Well, I think you need to look at how you're doing it. I think you need, uh, in some some regards, you probably need to look at who's doing it and how are you doing it. And you know, if you're consistently not winning work or you're winning work that is not profitable, there's really only two factors that go into that. The people that are preparing the estimates or the tools that they're using and, and or the way in which they're using the tools. So I would take a holistic approach and try to understand why are we failing? Why are we not doing as well as we could do? And then with that, understanding that, how are we going to improve that? And that typically involves, it may involve having to deal with telling folks that, that, that work and estimating that they need to do things differently. It certainly could involve using a different tool. If they're using a spreadsheet, that's generally not going to lead to success. So I think it's really trying to understand why are we not being successful? And then is there some, some coaching for the team that's required? And or is there different technology that we should be using and a different approach that we should be using? to drive better success. Well, Paul, I really appreciate your time today. Just let the uh, listeners know how they can get a hold of you. Sure. Um, so basically, uh, B2W software, you can go onto our, our website. You can get all kinds of information there. You can schedule a demo. You can go in and see videos, testimonials, and read about all the different uh, workflows that we support, see videos on how that software works. That's a good start. Or you can call us on our 800 number and talk with the sales folks, and they'll be happy to help you any way they can. That's beautiful. And we'll have links in the show notes to the website. Paul, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today on Construction Genius. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Eric. Thanks again for listening to Construction Genius. I trust you enjoyed my interview with Paul. There are a number of takeaways there in terms of how you can improve your estimating, uh, not only from a technology point of view, but also from a process point of view and a people point of view. Make sure you have the right people in the right positions who are detail oriented, who are able to build relationships with vendors and others so that they can maximize the effectiveness of the estimates that they are putting out for your company. If you have any questions about the show, feel free to reach out to me anytime. You can go to my website, constructiongenius.com slash contact. And feel free to give us a rating or a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you have suggestions for topics or guests that you would like to hear on the show, reach out to me again, constructiongenius.com slash contact. I'm always open to suggestions and I appreciate you listening. Have a terrific week.